This is an Alina 10th syndicator, and the sticker on it says that it was last calibrated in 1982. So we're going to open it up, make sure that it's all nice and pretty and clean inside, try to get it set on zero, and then close it back up. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is remove the bezel glass. In order to do that, I'm going to turn this upside down or sideways or whatever you want to call it. And there are pinholes in the back of the face. Now, it'd be best if I had a watchmaker's wrench, but I don't. So I'm just putting a pin in there, holding it still while unthreading the bezel glass. Then the, the number face of it is just sitting in there. So I'm going to tip it just so it falls out and hopefully it doesn't disturb the needle too much. Let's just pretend that I didn't drop the bezel glass onto the workbench and look at that, perfect. Next, there's a ring inside of the steel body that fits into a race around the outside of the aluminum backing. And in order to remove that ring, it's held in place by spring tension and there are three small screws around the perimeter of it. And those screws push the ring out into the race on the aluminum part. So all we need to do in order to remove that is to loosen those screws up. And once that's done, the ring will de-expand? I don't know. Contract out of the inner race on the aluminum piece. And the aluminum piece should slide right off. I want to mention that anytime you're working on something like this, you need to make sure that your screwdrivers are a near perfect fit for the screws in the piece because you can ruin it in light speed. All right, now that those three screws are loosened up, the back, the aluminum piece here, should theoretically just slip right off. However, it usually needs a little bit of persuasion. The uh, steel ring doesn't always fall back into place. And also, while you're pulling it off, make sure that you don't bend the uh, hands. That those are important. Next is removing the hands. And in order to protect the face, I'm going to put this slip of paper with a small slit in it behind them so that I don't scratch the uh, already aged patina looking uh, face on the indicator. Now I'm using these two dental tools, just basically like pry bars underneath the, uh, the hand here so that I can slip it right off of the shaft that it is pressed onto. It comes off pretty easily. Realistically speaking, you should be using a type of watchmaker's tool that I don't remember the name of it, but this works just fine if it's all you've got on hand. The small hand also comes right off and then the paper falls away because there's nothing for it to sit on anymore. Now the face is only held in by one very small flathead retention screw and I needed to make very sure that I had the right shape and size screwdriver for this because it's already pretty pretty rough. So I actually uh, used a honing stone on one of my screwdrivers to make sure that it was just right and I very delicately removed that screw. Once that screws out the face is basically just sitting there so I can use a pair of tweezers to remove that gently inner workings are exposed. Now, as far as the inner workings go, this is all very delicate gear work. It's just like working on a very expensive watch. Now you can see these two screws here that retain the head to the uh, body. Now, which part's the body? I don't know if this is the body or if the other part's the body. Either way, these two screws hold in place. The top one you can see is slotted, and that slot allows you to adjust the gear mesh between the horizontal gear and the vertical gear where they interface to change the direction of the mechanism. So I'm going to very carefully remove those two screws so that I can remove the face or body or this part that you can see. That's going to come off. Now you can see that I, I removed the top screw first. That way I can unmesh the two gears while I'm threading out the bottom screw, that way I don't accidentally apply any inappropriate tension or force to the, uh, the gear mesh. I don't want to wear that in any way. And now that that's off, you can see the, the main body. You see this part. So this is the mechanism that translates the movement of the hand to the movement of the dial. It's basically a long rod with some gear teeth on the end that interfaces with this round wheel in here, which then has gear teeth cut on the side 
or the top of it, perspectively. It's sort of like a rack gear, but bent around a circle. Now, this small screw here is responsible for the forward travel stop of the rod in there. The uh, backward stop, which we'll see in a minute, is fixed. This one's adjustable, so we're going to adjust it outward so that there's extra play in there while we're working on this and calibrating things. Then we're going to take the side off. Now taking the side off just involves removing these three screws and then lifting straight up. There are alignment pins that will bind if you don't lift straight and there is a spring arm in there that controls whether this is measuring up or down. So up and then the spring engages and it twists off. Now that's removed. Now you can see these two small bearing places, one for the gear and one for the arm. These are actually tiny, tiny, little, itty bitty ball bearings. You can see if I can get this into focus here. Oop. And let's just say they're, they're tiny. We don't really want to be taking these apart. They're not anything that I'd want to try to put back together and I'm not sure how far they come apart. So now you can see the circular rack gear of sorts and that it's only cut a quarter of the way around. I guess they didn't need to cut it any further than that because it doesn't need to even utilize as much as it has already. And then, <clears throat> so when we put this back together, we're going to want to make sure that that is, let's say, appropriately placed. Underneath that is the arm that has the gear teeth cut into it in order to interface with the back side of that gear. You can see there's a smaller gear cut into the back of that. And then beneath that, you can see the rear zero screw. So that's the positive stop for the arm when it's moving backwards. The only way to zero this once it's put back together is to install the hands at zero while it's resting against that stop. As far as zeroing it in the other direction, you can see this small nub of a screw here. That small nub of a screw adjusts the forward travel of it. So the arm only moves in between those two screws and one of them is in fixed position. So if I hold this in place you can basically see how this is going to operate once it's all put back together. The forward stop will be adjusted once I install the hands against the rear stop. These are all very precise parts, so any damage to anything in here can really throw off the measurements that this can provide. So I started looking at the gear under magnification, and under high magnification, which I can't really show on camera, the teeth up here towards this end appear to have some rubbing wear on them. So I'm going to make sure that those are installed outside of the range of the indicator once it's all installed and put back together. As far as lubrication goes, I am no watchologist, but I use the finest oil that I have, which is, I think, Mobile Velocite, and I used a very small syringe to apply it in the bearing locations. Then I blotted up everything that was left, so you can't even really see that any lubrication was applied, which is perfect. Beautiful. So now I've got the lower arm timed to the upper gear in the place that I want it. And all I need to do now is reinstall the side cover. Now, in order to reinstall the side cover, I want to make sure that this spring arm is as close to center as I can, as I can balance it so that it goes into the slot that it needs to go into in the lower arm. Then I'm going to hold it underneath that upper lever again and try to slowly lower it down onto the alignment pins and into place. Then once I get it exactly where I need it, all I need to do is reinstall the screws. Which, don't over tighten them. Now as far as these ball bearing screws go, this is the type of wrench that you would need in order to unlock the outer screw. And then you can use this two prong wrench to adjust those bearings in or out. Honestly, it's a nightmare. If you don't have to do it, don't do it. it. It is so sensitive, but you need to make sure they're adjusted so there's no drag, no slop, and just they're perfect. 
it's a nightmare. Now, once I've got the whole thing reassembled, you can see this, this works the way that it's intended still, which is good. And now we're going to, after I already inspected it under magnification for any wear or damage, we're going to reinstall the face portion of this. Now I could remove those two screws right there and drop all the gears out of this and fully clean them, but I checked it. It doesn't need to be done. I blew this out with keyboard cleaner. I checked everything and I applied the same small amount of lubrication to any points that needed it. I don't feel like taking the whole thing apart. We're not going to. If you do, though, keep track of where everything goes. Watch out for that watch spring. They can very easily be ruined or unsprung or just, yeah. If you don't have to do it, just don't do it. Trust me. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the gear mesh between the upper and lower here is very important, and that's what that slotted screw is for. So I'm going to install this as unmeshed as possible. And then I'm going to, once I get the screws in and not necessarily tightened down, I'm going to engage the mesh of the two gears and adjust it until I believe it's perfectly in the place it needs to be. Which can be troubling, but I'll show you right here after I get it free flowing yet still secured to some degree. I'll show you what definitely improper mesh and what I believe to be perfect mesh look like. You don't want to put too much drag on the gears because that's going to bind up the whole thing. But you can't have it so loose that there's backlash. If there's backlash, all of your measurements will be inaccurate. You can see how sensitive this is with the gear mesh that as you move it in and out, it actually rotates the gears, meaning that they're going to be in a different location based on how close they are. Now you can see here, I'm able to move the gear in the back without moving the gears in the front. So that's too loose. That means that there's backlash in there, and that can translate into a very large measurement when you're talking about very precision instruments. Now, if I move it into mesh too far, it's going to bind. So I've got to make sure that I don't apply too much pressure. You want just the smallest amount of slack in there. You can see in this location, as soon as that rear gear even trembles, the other gears start to engage and turn. There's nearly no backlash there. So that's how that's going to get installed. You can see here, me just testing the ranges of the thing, that the mesh looks good. There's no wiggle or wobble or any of that going on in there. Once that's all set, you can reinstall the face. Again, take very special care with these tiny slot or flat-headed screws. You can destroy them with the flick of a wrist. So that's all installed. Now from there we want to install the hands, but we want to make sure that the positive stop is engaged in the back. We want it resting against that one screw that can't be changed. Then we can install the hands at zero. So we'll start with the smaller hand because the smaller hand is behind the larger hand and we don't want to have to worry about trying to sneak it in underneath anything if we bump it. So when you first balance the hands on top of the shafts, they're a little bit forgiving. You can kind of dial them into the right place. And then I should be using a watchmaker press for this, which I actually have, but I'm just going to press this on with these tweezers. I can tell when it's engaged because it bottoms out very gently on the bottom of the shaft. Now for the large hand, it's not quite as forgiving as the small hand, let's say. You've really got to try to get that lined up just right when you first put any pressure on it. It won't rotate quite as easily on the shaft just because of the way that it engages it. So I'm using the tweezers again to just very gently yet firmly put it into the right place. And you can see it's just about center but kind of just want to snake it a little bit to the side. It takes a little bit of effort, but it shouldn't damage anything inside as long as you're very gentle and it's not fully engaged. Once it's on there, you can press it into place and it should always zero out at the back stop. Now, <clears throat> when you switch to the front stop, you can see there is plenty away from zero in there right now. 
so that screw has to be significantly adjusted inward. Now unfortunately, the hand hits the screwdriver every time I try to adjust it. So I adjusted it while slipping around the hand every single time it made a revolution all the way up to just about the top. And now I can dial it in to zero there. And if all goes right and you're lucky, you'll wind up with an indicator that is zeroed on both ends of the travel. Now I'll show you that steel ring that I was talking about in the beginning that locks into that aluminum race on the inside of the back of the face. So it just sits in this groove around the outside of the body here. And there is a stop up in the top left hand corner here where the two ends meet up and lock into place. So it's just, you want to take this out and make sure that it's round. Because if it's not, it'll it'll drag when putting the face back on or perhaps when you're twisting it around in circles. So it sits in this groove here and on mine the groove was pretty chewed up so I had to actually hand file with a, a very small diamond abrasive uh, just to make sure that was all perfectly smooth and cleaned out in there. Now the way that this works is that spring is again pushed out by those three screws in the back so it flares it out just enough to hold it in that inner race on the aluminum. So once you've verified that it's round looking you can reinstall it the way that it was and sometimes they're a little bit finicky because it wants to close in on itself the entire time so you've really got to make sure that you've got it in there just right once it's properly seated you can slip the aluminum body over it with ease and make sure that you try to align the groove with where the ring will be when you go to tighten down the screws in the back you want to make sure that you get the steel spring part into the groove on the aluminum otherwise you'll bind the entire outer body of this and it won't ever turn right so once you make sure that that's all set right it should be able to tighten those screws down and then smooth slidely around in circles when you turn it from there there's a small pin up here that aligns with a notch on the face dial so you'll make sure that's aligned properly because that'll keep it from slipping when you try to turn it around in circles and make sure that you can always adjust it smoothly. Once that's aligned, you can thread the bezel glass or the outer ring of the bezel glass onto the aluminum body gently. And once you get that thread started, you can rotate this to the side again and just lock it in place with I mean either a watchmaker's wrench or Alternatively, you can use the right size punch to hold it up against the body while you tighten the glass down. There's no need to over tighten that or go crazy, but it should be firmly snugged up. Otherwise, it can come loose while you're trying to adjust the, the zero location while twisting it. And if everything went well, and you probably took none of my advice, your indicator might work better than it ever did. Or it might not. Just be careful. And thanks for watching.